grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. The secretary answered the telephone at the church, and there was a voice on the other end and said, uh, Could I please speak to the head hog of the trough? And she said, Pardon me? And he said, Could I please speak with the head hog of the trough? And she said, Well, she said, If you're referring to the pastor, she said, That's not the way we talk about. He's our pastor, or we call him the reverend. He said, well, I understand. He said, but I want to contribute $10,000 to the building fund. And she said, you know, one second. She said, I think I give the big pig coming through the door right now. <laughs> Money talks, doesn't it? Money talks very loud when we have needs for money or whether we don't have a need for money. And somehow or another we associate the value of a person, the worth of a person with money. We even talk about money in those terms of the worth of a person. How much is he or she worth? And we're not talking about the value that that person has as a person, but how much money they have in a bank account. And quite often we make the association between money and being a pillar of the church. Somehow or another, we get it into our minds that if somebody contributes a lot of money to the particular church that they belong to, that they must be recognized for contributing such money, or that they must be recognized not only for contributing, but they probably are a pillar of the church. The reality is that that association that we have between money on one hand and how much importance the individual has is usually misplaced. And yet that is the standard of the world. There may be exceptions to it. There may be people who don't think in those terms. But if you don't have money, most people think that there must be something wrong with you or you must have done something wrong in order for you not to have more money because after all, God blesses those he wants to bless those who are rich. Right? That's a sign of blessing. Well, in our story, the gospel lesson for today, we really have a different perspective. And Jesus comes with a different perspective. Jesus tells the disciples, come over here, listen with me, see what is happening. He's almost using this as a way of demonstrating the point that he wants to make to them as he is preparing to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. And the point that he makes is, and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your words, the words that your Son has spoken, the gospel that has been preached, the gospel that has been handed down to us as we look at it for ourselves, Lord. Help us to realize what it is that you want us to do, how this applies to each one of us, Lord. For you are a great God, and we don't want to miss what you have to say. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. What was it that the widow put into the plate that drew so much attention, that drew Jesus' attention, so much so that he wanted to make this a teaching moment for his disciples? I think if we take all of the things away from the core of this text, if we take all of the trimmings away, we could get sidetracked to talk about the fact that Jesus was watching and Jesus is watching you when you put your money into the collection plate. Or we can go down another road and say that she was probably despondent and she didn't care anymore. What the heck? Two pennies, just throw them in there. And I have done my duty. I don't need to do anything else. But the core of the text will remain. The core of the text is that Jesus is turning around 
the economy that we're used to. Our economy runs on money, and the economy back then ran on money. But the point that Jesus is first of all making is that it's not what, give, what we give to Jesus that counts. All the people other than this widow put in large sums of money. Remember, that's what Jesus is saying. But he doesn't focus on that. He doesn't focus on how much they put in, and he doesn't focus on how much you and I put into the collection. What he does focus on, what I think is the first point, is that we are evaluated in terms of what we keep for ourselves. You see, if we give out of our discretionary spending, if we as people just give what we can afford to give, if we just give because, well, we have taken care of all of our needs, and we've taken care of all of our wants, and now we have some money left over, and that can be given to the collection plate. We're missing the point because Jesus is saying that what is so wonderful about this woman is that she kept nothing for herself. She kept nothing for herself. She gave everything that she had. Why would a person do that? Perhaps, as I suggested earlier, because she might have been despondent, and, and why shouldn't I just give my last penny? I don't have anything anyway. More likely than not, that's not the answer. The answer is that she gave everything because she trusted. She trusted in her Lord and Savior whom she knew was God God. We find the same thing in the story, the Old Testament lesson of the uh, widow of Zarephath. She trusted God to provide. And if you look at scripture again and again, there's a distinction drawn between those who do not trust and rely on themselves and rely on their own abilities or rely on their money or rely on their acuity or whatever, however you want to refer to those, on the other hand, who trust in the Lord. Now that theme is a very important theme throughout Scripture, and it's a very important theme in this particular passage. You know, when I asked Colton to step into the plate, I wasn't sure that he was going to do it. If I had asked most people here, they probably would have thought, what, what's going on? I'm sure up to another one of his bad moments. But, the reality is that each of us is not only called to step up to the plate, but to step into it. Robert Moffat was a wonderful missionary from Scotland. He was born in 1795, and when he was 12 years old in 1805, 1807, when he was 12 years old, he went to a church, and the service so moved him that when it came time for the collection, he asked the usher to please put the basket, in those days they didn't use plates, they used basket, to put the basket down by him. And he stepped into it. And the usher, shocked, said, boy, what do you think you're doing? He said, I'm giving my complete self to Jesus Christ. And another eight years after working as a gardener in order to serve, to save enough money, he finally went to South Africa and became a missionary. And there he wasn't very successful. But on one of his trips home, back to Scotland, he was preaching at a church, and there was a young man listening to him, who later on, not only became his son-in-law, but became one of the most important missionaries that has ever been sent to Africa, David Livingston. And David Livingston was incredibly successful in bringing people to the throne of God, and bringing people to Jesus, where Jesus can transform them. Not where he could, but where Jesus can transform them. Because you see, that's evangelism. Evangelism is not for us to transform somebody else. It's for us to take that person in our prayer and otherwise, and take them to the throne of God, take them to Jesus, where Jesus can transform them and can change them. And so Robert Martin, stepping into that plate, symbolically told us what we again and again see in Scripture, that before we give anything, we need to give ourselves. Let me just quickly turn to a passage 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is thanking the Corinthians and talking about the Macedonians who contributed so much. And here's what he says in one of his verses, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this was not expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. You see the order? The order is not, oh, this must be a person who's committed because look at the amount of money they're contributing. The order is that these people first gave themselves to the Lord, and it was out of that action that the money flowed from them to the people of Jerusalem. And you and I say it every Sunday when we take communion, just, at, just before the great Thanksgiving, what do we say? Merciful God, merciful Father, we offer what you have first given us. What? Ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of the law. You see the order again? Every single time that you say that, you are in effect saying that you're stepping into the plan. Not just up to it, but not just the past but to be in it, that we are first giving ourselves, and it's out of that action that our, that our generosity flows, and that our money flows, and that the work that can be done with money can be done, not the other way around. Now, that's a big task. I don't know whether you feel that way, but when I think about putting my whole self in, the whole people, remember Jack's whole people, Put your whole self, put your self in, take your whole self out. Putting our whole selves in, that's not as easy as it sounds. Is it? Is it isn't for me. I find myself, you know, pulling myself up. What's that passage in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, where it states that we are to be a living sacrifice? Well, in that sense, it's one commentator, I think it was Chuck Swindoll, said, you know, I pull myself off of that altar every day. I may try to climb on the altar and be a living sacrifice, but I come along and I just rip myself right off and go along and do the things that I want to do. It's tough. And here is why I think it's so tough at times. It's so tough at times because there's a difference to be made between got and get. Some of us think that we got to be baptized. Some of us think that we got to be taking communion. We got to go to worship service. We've got to give. We've got to. And if that's our orientation, it would be much better if we didn't. Because that's not how God approaches. He didn't approach the cross with the got to. He approached the cross wanting to be there voluntarily because of his love for us. And he hasn't, hasn't, isn't asking us to do any got to's. But we get to. We get to. We get to be baptized. We get to take communion. We get to be in our offering. We have the privilege of all of those things that we get to do because of what God has done for us. There were two men who were rather wealthy, a lawyer and a uh, no surprise, no, a lawyer and a businessman. And they were asked by the congregation to join the, the denomination's team that was going to go around the world and check up on, on different uh, missionary sites. And when they came to Korea, this was in the early 1950s or the middle 1950s, when they came to Korea after the Korean conflict was over, the, they were driving along and they stopped because there was a strange scene in one of the fields. Here, was a man behind the plow, and the plow was being pulled by a young boy. They looked at this and they thought, that's sort of strange. And they stopped, and the man, the lawyer, asked the guy and said, he said, did you notice that? And uh, the guy said, yeah. He says, that's the Chi Noi family. He said, do you know him? He said, no. Yeah. He said, the church that was being built after the missionaries were here, the church that was being built, they didn't have enough money, and they they had no money themselves as family, and so they sold the ox to get enough money to build up their church. 
And the lawyer said, wow. He said, that's really, that's really a huge sacrifice that they made. And the guy said, no, that's not the way they look at it at all. He said, they look at it and believe that they were very fortunate. 